The world of grading had a massive shakeup last week when it was announced that Collectors, the parent company of PSA, had acquired SGC. This means the number one and number two players in the grading market have joined forces. But the question now becomes, what does this mean for you and your cards? If you are looking to grade your cards, does your strategy now change? Is this a good thing for PSA? Is this a good thing for SGC? Or is this opening opportunity for other companies like Beckett, CGC, ISA, or others? To answer these questions, I am bringing in our grading expert, Joe Davis from Got Baseball Cards into the studio today. And we are going to break down everything happening now within the world of grading. Joe, welcome back to the Jeff Wilson Show. First time actually in this studio. Yes, yes. This is our new studio inside Cards HQ. Yeah, love it, love it. Great to be back. Appreciate it. Thank you for coming by today. And it's very timely. Yes. Because obviously last week, we were both surprised by the news. I didn't see it coming. No. Nope. Um, I, I honestly wouldn't have been surprised if maybe there was an announcement that maybe someone like Fanatics bought SGC. Right. But I didn't expect collectors, the parent company of PSA to buy SGC. I just I just didn't predict that to happen. They right. were battling each other and it seemed oh, like yeah. that battle was escalating. Now, you know, I, I, I understand why it, it's, you know, collectors probably looks at this and says SGC is is gaining on them as the number two in the market. Yeah, certainly I mean, in the sports card area. In the yes. sports card area right. for sure. Um, they're gaining on them, and I imagine collectors found it annoying that they were doing all of these low cost specials, you know, nine dollar grading of mm -hmm. certain tops products and all these types of things, quick turnaround. And they were definitely SGC's card volume was ramping up and up and up. Now PSA was doing just fine on their own. Like Absolutely, they, they were posting oh, yeah. big big numbers as well. Yes. They didn't seem to be slowing down. But they were watching, you know, this this other company gain a little bit of market share, gain a little bit of market share, and they probably said, I guess, enough with that, <laughs> you know. Um, and honestly, if you look at the grading spectrum from PSA's perspective, they probably didn't perceive the other companies out there as much of a threat right now, at least on Correct. the sports card side. Correct. Beckett, which has slipped a lot. Yes, dramatically. You know, uh, CGC, which doesn't really have it going on the sports card side. No, no only on the TCG. Only on TCG, yeah. And then you've got others like ISA and TAG that are trying to gain market share, but they still are, are far behind um, where obviously the others are. Right. When you heard this news, Joe, last week, what was your first thought? Uh, at first, I, yeah, I was confused too because I thought, oh no. My first thought was, I mean, I love the SGC brand. I thought, oh, no, is the SGC brand going to go away? That was when I just first heard about it. But then after I saw the comments from both Nat Turner and, and Peter Steinberg that they were going to remain independent companies, I, I, I took a breath and I was like, okay. And then I realized that PSA, in my opinion, PSA saw SGC as a great asset, would be a great addition you know, to, to collectors. Um, and, yes, they have gained traction. SGC, above all of them, has grown the most in notoriety over the last few years uh you know they they went from being way further down the pack to, to definitely the second most respected in grading with sports cards uh and so you know i, I spoke with someone yesterday about this i said sometimes the the big lion buys up the you know they buy up the competition and in this case they did but i see that as an opportunity for collectors to have two strong grading brands working independently with each other as to what may happen in the future, you know, remains to be seen. But for now, all of the comments are they're going to be independent brands working under the collector's umbrella. And so if that's the case, then I think it was a, a it's done wonders for the SGC brand mm -hmm. because I've already seen demand for SGC has rapidly increased because suddenly PSA has said, we respect the SGC yeah. brand. Yeah. So it yeah. will be very interesting to see if this has an impact on the value of SGC cards in the secondary markets. That is the one area where SGC has really struggled mm -hmm. with modern and ultra modern. Right. With right. vintage SGC cards, do really well. Yes. 
uh, compared to PSA cards. But with modern and ultra modern SGC cards, you know, an SGC 10 lags way behind a PSA 10. An right. SGC 9 5 can barely keep up with a PSA 9 and sometimes sells for less than a Correct. PSA 9, right. you know? Right. So it's, it's, uh, it will be interesting to see if that changes. I'm actually not in of the mindset that that is going to change. And some people out there may disagree with me. Some people may say, like you just said, that now that SGC almost has the endorsement from PSA that people will perceive SGC as a higher quality product. Right. I don't, I don't think that's going to happen. What I think is going to happen, and I could be completely wrong. I'm just speaking from my own opinion, you know, speculating here. I think PSA is going to position SGC as the lower cost brand, the brand that does all of these promotions, the brand that does all these specials, the brand that will grade cards for $9 when a new Tops release comes out, the brand that is is more of a value-oriented brand when it comes to modern and ultra-modern, which is how SGC has kind of positioned themselves. That's how they've gained the traction on PSA. The, the traction that SGC's gained has not been with the you know high-end cards. Um, at except least, on Vintage. Except for Vintage, right, except for right. Vintage. Uh, yeah, modern and ultra modern, the, the traction that they've gained has really been with the lower end cards right. where they're dealing with less expensive cars, but they're turning them around quickly and they're turning them around for cheaper like price. Brand new releases. Correct. They've been running those specials on you know various tops products. You yeah. Know, events of. And and so PSA over the last year has become more aggressive with running specials of their own. They, you know, they you, they've been running, you know, various, you know, uh, modern baseball yeah. types yeah, of specials. They'll, they'll pick a random sport and a random time period and yeah, give a special deal. And I think they were doing that because they were seeing, they were sensing some competitive threat from SGC. My guess now is that PSA will do less specials. PSA will stick more to their core pricing, maybe even bump their core pricing a little bit. PSA is going to let SGC play more at the at the lower end of the market psa is going to play a little bit more at the level above that and above when it comes to ultra modern and modern that's my guess you know the idea that these are separate companies separate brands and that you know that psa is going to maintain collectors is going to maintain them as separate brands um i i buy that only to a degree because they they're still they're still going to be a common strategy yeah, will they right. exist to the consumer? Will they exist independently? Yes. Will SGC continue to keep its logo and name and its own separate submission process? Yes. But will there be somebody at the top, Nat Turner and his team at the top, who are going to assess both brands and 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 ensure that they're getting the most out of their investment in both brands by strategically positioning both brands in a complementary way to each other, they 1000% will do that. Yes. And to me, what that means is they're not gonna have PSA and SGC in competition as much as they have been in competition over the last couple of years. To me, that means SGC owns the lower end discount of the ultra modern market and PSA owns the level above that and above. I think you're going to see actually more more separation between the two. So if that is the case, then I actually don't think it helps SGC cards in the secondary market when it comes to ultra modern. I think that SGC, almost if anything, it plants their flag as the lower cost leader, but that also will keep their secondary market prices forever down. I could be completely wrong, and you may have a yeah, completely different. Yeah, yeah, you may you may disagree yeah. with me. This is just me me kind of speculating. What what do you think? Well, I think um, one thing I've always said about SGC is that you know they have phenomenal customer service. Their hardcore collectors respect them, uh, especially on the vintage side, but they've never had the marketing dollars behind them that PSA does. Now, all of a sudden, this when I when I spoke to my rep from SGC the day this went down, he was ecstatic, and and part of it was like now we've got you know, the marketing team that collectors can put, you know, the dollars that they can put behind our brand as well. And so you imagine taking the marketing team that PSA has had, and then they can put that same kind of marketing behind SGC's brand to bring them to, to worldwide, you know, recognition that the PSA brand has 
which I think will elevate the value of SGC. Uh, over, uh, overnight, I just I had some emails from collectors saying, I'm getting so many hits on my SGC cards. I'm getting so many people making me offers on SGC. And a lot of them were wanting to buy the SGC to try to cross over to PSA because they felt like now that it's the same parent company, there would be a better chance for crossovers. So that's a strategy that seems to be forming in the marketplace. Whether it plays out or not remains to be seen. But I think uh, just the branding, the marketing can definitely help the SGC values. It's interesting. That's an interesting theory. I, and the truth is, none of us know right now. No, like, we you know, we'll, we'll, we'll find out over the course of the next year or two. We'll see how it all plays out. I, I you know, the leadership of collectors, probably even they don't fully know. They have plans. I'm sure, sure. they have ideas and strategies for how this is all going to play out. But they're, they're also going to have to kind of see how the market reacts to all of this and tweak over the next six months or a year as they start to roll out strategies. You are right that that this now means that SGC will likely have a larger marketing budget and will get more exposure. I do agree with that. The question is, will that help or hurt their, their card prices? Because you would think, well, more marketing means more interest, more submissions, more respect on the secondary market. That could be true. Or it could mean that the marketing is going into, once again, positioning SGC as the lower cost alternative um, you know, the promotions, the deals, the specials, all that stuff, which I, which, which I think will fuel even more submissions at the low end. And I don't think it will help the secondary market prices. I could be wrong. I don't know. I, I it will be interesting to watch. Um, yeah, I don't know. It, it's, it's, it's fascinating how this is going to play out. There are though, certainly advantages for SGC, as you said, uh, marketing budget from, from PSA or from collectors. Mm -hmm. Another thing I'll mention as well, is technology. Um, right. PSA has done impressive additions to their technology, grading reveals and submission centers and uh, you know different things that they've done. So this probably means more technology is gonna roll out to SGC. SGC has invested in their own technology, you know, when it comes to kind of their app and you know, various things over the last year but they still don't have the technology PSA has and they've been lagging behind. So right. there will definitely be, I'm sure, more investment into SGC. Um, I, I mean, overall, I think, I think it's, well, I don't know, I'll ask this. Overall, do you think this is a good thing for the hobby or do you think this is a neutral thing or do you think this is a bad thing? Overall, I think it's gonna be positive. I do, I just, um, I think, we know because of the volume of submissions we do with both PSA and SGC, we know what a great job SGC does with their customer service. Uh, and those who use them really appreciate the brand. A lot of people haven't tried them, but those who use them really appreciate the brand. And I think this is going to raise their stature in the industry. I think it's going to, um, there'll be more, can, maybe there's, I, w one big question I've already been asked is, are they going to, cross train graders to say a 10 here is a 10 here or are they going to have stand they, peter in his announcement said that you know our grading standards are not changing so basically he was saying that the sgc standard is what we go by which is their internal standards they follow so that's a big question too but overall i think it's positive for the industry um in general, I'm against monopolies, but you've still got the BGS brand, you've still got the CGC brand, you've got the other startups, you know, that are wanting to compete. Uh, but I think because I have so much respect for the SGC brand, I think the fact that they can now get the exposure they deserve, I think it will elevate their brand. One other thought is that because SGC has so much respect on the vintage side, and you know, if you look at gym rate, there are decades where SGC only trails PSA, you know, much, they're, they're much tighter, you know, in terms of volume than, than on the ultra modern market. So possibly collectors, I'd, uh, plan is to do something to focus the SGC on the vintage side because they're already respected there and really maximize that piece of the puzzle. Yeah. Remains that's to be seen. But you know, you think about the two most expensive cards ever sold in the hobby or yeah. SGC, SGC slabs. I think it's actually maybe the three most or three, expensive. Right, three. Yeah. The three most expensive that, and that had to be gnawing at PSA. Oh, absolutely. Like if you're PSA and you're known as kind of the, you know, most respected highest ends, 
you know, grading authentication company, yet the three most valuable cards ever sold are in your competitor's holder. Mm -hmm. That ha that had to be annoying PSA. Oh, yeah. So so um, yeah, that's that's an interesting fact. Well, that will change that. if anyone ever lets go of one of the PSA ten mantles. That's oh yeah, of if, course. If one of those ever of hits the market again, of course. So that'll of change. Course. Of course. Um, but that might not be for a while. Right. That might right. not be for a while. Um, yeah, no, these are all good thoughts. Like it's, and, and I agree with you. SGC has, has part of the reason why they've had the success that they've had at increasing market share is because there's a lot of people that have had really good experiences submitting to SGC, the turnaround time, the customer service, as mm -hmm. you've said, um, and, you know, consistency with grading. You know, I think, I think SGC's done fairly well with that yes. as far as I've, as far as I've yes. seen and, you know, right. you know, comments from people who have done big grading submissions with them. Um, so th these are all things that I think are, are definitely positives in SGC scored and hopefully things that I don't think, I think those things will continue. I, I, you know, PSA would be silly to mess with or collectors would be silly to mess with those facets. I mean, if anything, they'll just want to encourage that more because right. those are yeah. areas where SGC shined. Right. My hope is that each company, um, can learn from the other, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, uh, SGC PSA, at least with our accounts, has done a great job with customer service. But I know sometimes with the consumer, I don't hear the same thing. But uh, hopefully, the, uh, the the phenomenal customer service that SGC has, you know, some PSA can learn from that. And then uh, certainly on the technology side, there's ways SGC can grow from what PSA has to offer and collectors can offer them that maybe they don't currently have. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be fascinating to watch. But Bef before we go any further, I want to talk a little bit about some of the other companies too and how this impacts them, but I want to make sure the audience understands your background in the history of all of this, oh, yeah. because, you know, you've got a card shop here in Atlanta called Got Baseball Cards. We obviously partnered with you at Sports Card Investor a few years ago. Uh, so all of, all of our viewers bulk grading submissions to PSA and SGC route through your card shop. Right, right. Um, but by the way, uh, if you haven't ever checked out that service, go check out that service. Uh, go to sportscardinvestor.com, click grading in the main menu bar. It's a great way to submit your cards to PSA or SGC because Joe and his team will pre-screen all the cards if you choose for them to do that. And we'll, you know, send you back cards that they don't think have a shot at getting, you know, a good grade and, and plus a lot of other value added services that they offer. So it's right. a great way to grade your cards. Um, but you've been in this since the very early stages. Oh, yeah, with yeah. PSA we, we, and we started, yeah, yeah, since 98. Yeah. We started working with PSA and SGC in 1998. Yeah. So, you know, and now last year we handled, uh, we had about 175,000 approximately cards come through us and submitted about 110,000 because there was plenty that we rejected. So those are big numbers. Yeah. I mean, you've got to be one of the over, so a hundred, over a hundred thousand cards submitted per year. You've got to be one of the biggest volume graders in the nation. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, and you, I know you also uh, started offering Beckett grading in the very early stages. We did, of, as soon of, as they launched. As soon as they launched. Yeah. So it's been a big part of your business at your card shop ever since the beginning. What's interesting, I see these, um, I don't know if you've ever seen these like social media graphs where it, um, it's like an animation and it shows like, I've seen these in the sports world where it shows like, um, uh, how betting odds have changed over over time, like over the course of the season. Like it's here's the MVP leaders, one, two, three, four, five, and it's like a line graph. And then it's as the season goes on, it's like this person dropped, this person rose up, and then this person fell totally out, and this person dropped, and this person rose up. Right. Kind of a neat way of visualizing. Sure. If you created one of those graphs in terms of who's one, two, three, and four in grading from the time you started, let's say, with Beckett. So, you know, whatever it was, early 2000s, right? Right. Through today, how would that graph have, you know, kind of changed throughout the years? Yeah, it's, and Beckett has fallen off so much. Um, there was so much demand for BGS slabs early on. Um, I think I've shared this story with you that I actually had a submitter years and years ago send me a Jordan PSA 10 and he said, please take it to the National and see if you can cross it to a BGS 9.5, which would be ludicrous now. Oh, my gosh. But at the time, it did cross. I remember the National. I got it back from BGS. Like, yeah, this one crossed over. He should be really happy, you know. And he was ecstatic. He was like, oh, this is great. This is great. Now I've got a 9.5 instead of a PSA 10. 
you would never think of that. And I mean, no. that's tens of thousands of dollars difference. Um, and so, you know, BGS, you know, we've, we've had talks about their, their need, at least in my opinion, to change their grading scale and catch up with the industry standard. And cause the, the nine five scale just doesn't work for Jim Mint. Mm-hmm. It's just confusing to, to new collectors, especially. So there's a lot of reasons, you know, I have, I have a lot of friends at BGS and, uh, um, I hope they get their act together and I hope that they, uh, can, you know, it, it's such, I mean, it's been such a respected brand, uh, but market share has fallen off dramatically. Yeah. I mean, they're like, sometimes they're like four or 5% of the overall market share now. Which is crazy because that, I mean, even, even when I got back, you know, into the hobby heavily, uh, about five, six years ago, at that point they were second to PSA but the gap was not that big. I mean, I remember the premium. I remember calculating the premium before market movers even existed. Mm-hmm. Back in like 2019, I was doing like Excel sheets, downloading sales off eBay, sales history off eBay, and and trying to calculate the ratios right. between PSA 10s and BGS 95s. And it was often the PSA 10 premium was 20 to 25%. That was pretty typical right. back in 2019. Today, you know, I mean, you'll you'll see PSA tens sometimes double BGS nine fives. You know, and and sometimes with with it's not always that extreme, but often it is. And sometimes with higher end cards, I mean, obviously the eighty six Fleer Jordan being an extreme example. But in that case, a PSA ten is often worth five times a BGS nine five on that card. Yeah, we get we get so many nine fives sent to us. And, and paying us to crack them out so that we can resubmit them to PSA. Yeah. Uh, and we've actually had a number t- to send to SGC as well. But yeah, I, I we crack out a lot of BGS 9.5s. And, and I get them in hand and I go, I can't believe I'm cracking out a Merino 84 Tops 9.5 because that's a tough card in yeah. a Jim Mint. And I was like, well, you know, we'll roll the dice and see how you do you yeah. know, at another company. But, but because of the disparity in the pricing, it's, it's happening more and more. Yeah, it's wild that that's happening. Would you would you say that back in those kind of early years after Beckett came out, would you would you have said back then that they were number one? Yes, okay. there there was a, definitely a, a season there where where they uh, were the most sought after, and that's who we were sending the most cards to, and. So, but that's how they've dropped off, how the mighty have fallen. Yeah. And even <laughs> so. really, really, even over the last few years, I mean, they had slipped yeah. behind PSA you know, at some point along the way, but then, I mean, they were, they were still a, you know, relatively close second to PSA yeah. five years ago. Yeah. At the time, like during the, the COVID boom in the industry, BGS was definitely number two yeah. at the, at the onset of that. At the onset of that. Yeah. And then somehow today they are a distant third. Uh, it feels like, um, you know, it, it feels like it's, it's PSA one, SGC two, and back at a distant third, when it, when it comes to new submissions, now what's interesting is there's still so many valuable slabs that exist out there mm-hmm. that are in BGS holders. Right. I had a, uh, so when this news broke the other day, um, there was a, a prominent dealer in the sports card hobby that was texting me about the news. And he said, I am now worried about the fact that I own some very, very, very high-end, very expensive cards in BGS labs, which I was, I didn't draw the conclusion that he drew from the news. And I'm like, that's okay, that's interesting. And he's like, he's like, I just think this further puts Beckett behind. He's mm-hmm. like, I think that the now, now PSA and SGC, you know, essentially joining forces underneath collectors. Mm-hmm. He's like, I just think this further separates from Beckett. It puts further pressure on Beckett and he said, unless they do something dramatic, I don't even know if they can sustain being in business too much longer. And like and so he's worried that, you know, if Beckett just continues to falter and die off, what does that do for the value of Beckett cards? And there are many, many high end cards in Beckett's labs. Yes. I own a bunch. Yes. I, I own, you know, cards that are fifty thousand dollars, a hundred thousand dollars, more than a hundred thousand dollars in Beckett slabs. And I don't know. I don't know how I feel about that right now. I guess. I mean, I I didn't I didn't like have the same alarm bells that he had, but I I can understand some of the concern that he has. Right. I mean, because as I said, you know, collectors has basically put their stamp of approval on SGC. Yeah. 
not BGS, not CGC. Uh, so, yeah, BGS, um, I, I had a long talk with one of my BGS reps not long ago, and probably three weeks ago, and I just said, a lot of collectors don't feel like y'all are relevant anymore. And so, because he was talking about our lack of submissions, and I was like, hey, we're still putting your brand out there. People aren't choosing you. So what is that telling you? You know, you've got to make, your changes have got to be made uh, if y'all want to survive and, and be relevant again because they've got to that point. I mean, BGS for us, I think, was was under 4 or 5% total of our submissions last year. So that's a very small volume where they used to be on par with PSA years ago. That's Yeah, that's that's wild. That's that's un, it's, it's, it's unfortunate because Beckett has such a good name in the legacy and the history of the sports card hobby mm -hmm. um and and hasn't an, has an important place in a lot of the biggest cards in the sports card hobby yes. and i i hope that that turns around for them i think what I, what I would love to see happen and i have no idea if this is going to happen and i've had people tell me who who have you know knowledge that this is not going to happen most likely but what i would love to see happen is i would love to see fanatics buy beckett because I think that that could inject some new life into Beckett. Obviously, it would inject new life into Beckett, right? And and frankly, it's kind of Michael Rubin's playbook. He bought PWCC. They were a distressed asset at the time. Mm -hmm. They were in trouble. Yeah. They were yeah. over leveraged. Right. You know, all that kind of it stuff. Had a lot of negative media. Yeah. for a while. So he bought them basically for pennies on the dollar, and now he's got a whole marketplace that he controls. And I'm sure they've got big plans for that coming up where they'll be expanding that. And he bought tops for pennies on the dollar. He bought tops as the distressed R asset. Yeah. So, I mean, the the distressed asset in grading right now is Beckett. Right. Like that's the distressed asset. Yes. And so to me, it would make, if, if Fanatics wants to get into the grading business, which Michael Rubin originally said that they wanted to get into the grading business, if they still want to get into the grading business, then in my opinion, buying Fanatics, that is the obvious path right now. And I hope it happens because I think if it happens, it will inject new life into Beckett and it will give people confidence once again. And I think, I think you'll see instant confidence in Beckett. If there was an announcement that Fanatics has bought Beckett, I think you would see an instant surge in the pricing of Beckett slabs on the secondary market because all of a sudden collectors would have confidence again that this company is going to grow and this company is going to be relevant 10 and 20 years right. from now. And, and has the marketing power. And has the marketing yeah. power. So the, the challenge would be, would they buy the entire Beckett company or would, or would Beckett split off their grading division? Because yeah, they may only be interested if they're interested at all, yeah. If they're interested in them, are they only interested in a grading division, or do they yeah. want to own their marketplace? Do they want to want to own their publishing you know, division and their online price guide and everything? Yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't think they would have as much interest in that. No. They don't. They don't need a marketplace. You know the. I, I would. Yeah, I wouldn't think they would have as much interest. So that's in the thing. Businesses. Beckett would have to say, "Sure, you can have sure. this piece of the pie." So yeah, that, that might be the challenge. They may say you take it all or you get none of it. So. And I don't think I don't think uh, Fanatics wants Southern Hobby, which I know is part of the whole Beckett family too now, right? right? Because right. I mean, obviously Fanatics has kind of been anti-distributor <laughs> versus yes. yeah. wanting to buy a distributor. That seems like an opposite, you know, strategy. So yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, because because uh, certainly it, from the get go, Ruben said that uh, Mike Ruben shared that they wanted to be in it. Mm -hmm. So it just remains, you know, and obviously they just lost the opportunity to buy SGC. Yeah, and and you know some have speculated was this a proactive move by PSA to protect themselves from fanatics mm -hmm. buying SGC? I wouldn't be surprised. I, I don't know any yeah. anything about that. I'm just saying some a lot of people have speculated that. I wouldn't be surprised because fanatics and SGC had a good partnership. I mean, right. you you could tell because yeah. SGC was running these promotions, uh, grading Topps products exclusively, mm -hmm. all these promotions around Topps products. Topps was, it seemed like providing some form of support for that, right. uh, maybe maybe just marketing support, but right. they were they were encouraging of it. Yeah. And so there was definitely a partnership there between Topps and Fanatics and SGC to some degree. Right. So I would not have been surprised if SGC, if, if Fanatics wanted to get acquire SGC or something at some point, 
Um, but obviously collectors beat him to the punch. Yeah, it's it's odd waking up to breaking news in the hobby that a company's been sold and Fanatics didn't buy them. Yeah, that's because true. usually it's always Fanatics acquires this company and Fanatics acquires this company. So yeah, it's uh, it's going to be interesting to see how it all plays out. So I want to bring it back to people today who are who are needing to grade cards. People, yes. I got a stack of cards I want to grade. And, you know, and hopefully they're going through our grading submission program, right. sportscardinvestor.com, click grading in the main menu bar to get your team and your service and your pre-screening and all that kind of stuff. Right. What is your advice when they're sitting there with a stack of cards trying to figure out who to grade with? Now that this news has just happened, what is your advice on how to make that choice on who to grade with? Well, we make it super easy because we don't make the submitter make the choice on the front end they can literally send to us and and say you know you know to tell us make make the best recommendation and what we literally do with a lot of orders is we will split them apart and say these make the most sense at PSA these make the most sense at SGC there's times where we'll also you know we offer do offer BGS and CGC uh, but in general most of the time we choose between PSA and SGC and so there are things that we think will grade better at a certain company than another so because of the tens of thousands we go through we know these things we know standards of different companies we we know what might land a 10 here and may land a nine somewhere else. So we uh, provide all that expertise as part of the screening where we will split out for the consumer. We'll tell them we've got 80 cards here we recommend for PSA. We've got you know 20 that we recommend for SGC or whatever the case may be. And so sometimes we, you know, for example, when we receive mid-grade vintage, SGC is a perfect example for that because the, the resale is similar, the cost is cheaper, the turnaround's quicker. Uh, but you know, if it's, if it's a high end, if it's a brand new $10,000 autograph that just came out of a pack and it looks clean and it passes our pre-screening, we're going to go to PSA with it. Mm -hmm. So at least as of today. And so, um, a perfect example, we had a lady coming with a 1920s strip card collection, over 1,100 cards, including 20 Babe Ruths, 15 Ty Cobbs. We laid everything out to her. We said, here's the advantages of using PSA for these. Here's the advantages of using SGC. She made the final call on it, but we helped educate her on both sides what she could expect, and she decided to go with SGC. So we're going to have hundreds of Hall of Famers coming back from the 20s that we'll be then selling on eBay and through our website. So, uh, But we make it as simple as we – because it, it is a tough choice. You're sitting there with a great collection and you don't know where to go with it. You want to maximize your return or or you want a logical decision for your own PC. So we don't require the submitter to tell us that it has to go one place or the other. We can literally guide them through the process. We literally email with the submitter after we've looked at the cards and tell them, here are our recommendations, but the submitter makes the final call as to what they want to do with them. Yeah. Awesome. That's uh, that's a really good service. And and as you said, I, it, it is nuanced, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, what goes where, there's a lot of factors that come into play there. Um, that's great that you provide that service. And of course, once again, for anyone listening who wants to take advantage of this service, it's wonderful. Sportscardinvestor.com, click rating in the main menu bar. Um, all right. Well, we've covered a lot of ground today. Never a dull moment in the world of sports cards Absolutely not. and and never and never a dull moment in the world of grading uh, right. you know we've seen a lot of twists and turns over the last couple of years and uh we didn't see this twist coming but no. who knows what what comes next from here um but it's going to certainly be a fun it's going to be a fun ride and it's going to be fun to see how all of this plays out with PSA and with SGC as well as with Beckett and all of the other companies as right. well. Yeah, as we say, the only thing constant in our industry is change. Yeah. <laughs> it That's, never ends. It is definitely proven true, and I'm sure change will continue to come, and it's going to be exciting to see. Yeah. So, awesome. All right, Joe, we'll appreciate you coming on the Jeff Wilson Show sure once thing. again. Always great to see you. Yeah. And uh, guys, for those of you out there who want to catch this show in podcast format, just a reminder, the full-length episodes are on Apple Podcasts as well as Spotify. And of course, the full videos are on YouTube on a separate channel called The Jeff Wilson Show. Make sure you're subscribed everywhere and we'll see you soon with our next episode. Take care.